just goes to show Jesus can do whatever it takes to get you. Jesus, I uh, fetched tiptoes all the time, whatever it takes. And I was that one that he left in 994. And you were that one. That's right. And there may be somebody here that's still the one he's looking for tonight's tonight. That's right. So I would be open to it. If he's calling you, please don't hesitate. Because tonight's tonight.
And if you will stand as we give honor to the reading of God's Word, Luke chapter 15. And we're going to read a portion of this chapter that quite often is overlooked whenever someone studies Luke 15. Luke 15, I'm going to begin in verse 8. And we're going to pray the Lord speak to us this evening. And we're going to ask Him just to be in our midst. Luke 15 and verse number 8. Now, let me tell you how I roll. Uh, if I've got to do my part and your part, it takes twice as long. So I'll do my part. I'll do the preaching. You do your part. You do the amen. If I've got to do the preaching and the amen, it takes me twice as long. So you ask how long is this going to last? That's partly up to you. Can I get some help from anyone? So, so don't make me stop and have to do your part, all right? I'll preach you amen. Let's have church and, and let's ask the Lord to move, all right? Luke 15, verse number 8. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I have lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Lord Jesus, visit with us tonight. We're nothing without you. We need you tonight. Not only do I ask you to anoint me to preach, I ask you to anoint our hearts to hear. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us this evening. Thank you for all that we've enjoyed. Thank you for being in your presence. Lord, we love you. We honor you. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. So speak to us tonight, Lord, by your grace, and we'll give you glory and all of the honor. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said amen. 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 You can be seated tonight, church. There are 1,189 chapters in the entirety of Scripture. All are equally inspired, some perhaps a little more inspiring than others. Of the 1,189 chapters, there are some chapters that really stand out to us. For example, Romans chapter 8, John chapter 3, Hebrews 11. And there are many others that we can recollect that really, really prompt us and really, really motivate us and speak to us. Luke chapter 15 is such a chapter. It's called God's Lost and Found Chapter. And really what you have is a sequence of events, a series of events in this chapter of something that's lost, search that's found and made, something that is found, and then the end result and consequences, there is great rejoicing. Amen. Now it all begins, the backdrop we read in verse 1. Then drew near to him all of the publicans and the sinners in order to hear it. So the Bible says that on this particular day, Jesus was teaching as he so often would do. Oh, to have heard Jesus teach. Oh, to have heard Jesus preach. What it must have been like to have been in that audience and to have listened in as Jesus taught. I'm standing before you tonight and I'm preaching to you the Word of God, but who understands he was the Word of God? Can I get an amen from you? There was an occasion when some people came to arrest Jesus and literally he arrested them with his words and they marveled and they said, this man does not teach as the other rabbis teach, but they acknowledged that as he teaches, he does so with one who has a Lord. So imagine, if you will, here's, here's Jesus. He was seated as they would so often do in their custom and the people would stand and, and, and Jesus was teaching them. And the Bible says that here come the publicans. They're the tax collectors and they're the sinners. So for the sake of the illustration, we'll allow this side of the room to be the publicans and uh, the tax collectors and the sinners. So everyone over here say hello to the tax collectors and say hello to the sinners. They're the ones over here. Now don't get too excited because your turn's coming in just a moment. <laughs> And so Jesus is over here and he's teaching them and he's preaching to them. Here are the onlookers. Here are the publicans. Here are those that are looked down upon by culture in that particular day. Because the tax collectors in particular were looked upon, listen, as traitors in particular to the Jews. And so here are the publicans and here are the sinners. And they're pressed in in order to hear him teach and hear him preach. And they're listening to him and they're receiving him glad. And then the Bible tells us that over here on the other side are... The Pharisees and the scribes. So there they are. And everyone wants to say, boo, who knows what I'm talking about. 
And so the Pharisees and the scribes, they're watching this, they're observing this, and, and they're listening to Jesus as he's teaching the tax collectors and, and sinners. And the Bible says that they begin to murmur. Now, now the word murmuring literally is an undercurrent. In other words, that they're, they're talking in a whisper, they're muttering, they're murmuring among themselves. And here is their indictment of Jesus. They declare, this man receives sinners and he eats with them. And so verse 3 says that Jesus, who knows their heart and knows their thinking, speaks this, listen, speaks this parable, singular, not parables, plural, speaks this parable unto them. So literally Luke 15 is one parable, not three. It's one with three parts that he speaks to the Pharisees in order to correct their misthinking and their aggravation toward him for eating and ministering of the tax collectors and sinners. That's the whole purpose of Luke 15. Jesus is addressing the stinking thinking of the Pharisees and scribes who are literally fit to be tied over the reality that he would stoop to the level in their minds, lower himself to minister to the tax collectors and sinners. And everyone in the house ought to praise the Lord that he does. Amen. 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 Jesus came to save sinners of whom I'm chief. And they that are whole, do not have to have church in here. Can I get some help? They that are whole do not need a physician. Amen. And so Jesus speaks the parable. Do you remember the first part? Do you not? We just got through singing about it. What man, if he had a hundred sheep, one were lost, would not leave the ninety and nine, go after the one till he finds it, after he finds it, he puts it on his shoulders and he comes back and calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me for this my lost sheep that is found. Isn't it interesting? He puts it on his shoulders. Isaiah tells us that the government will rest upon his shoulders. If he can uphold all of the governments of the world, certainly he can take care of you and me. Amen? So he goes after the one until he finds it and he pursues it. Now remember, he's speaking this to the Pharisees who are angry and outraged and incensed over the reality that he is ministering, watch, to the tax collectors and sinners. Well, then you remember he would tell about the man that had two sons. The younger would come and beg for his inheritance. He would give it to him. He'd go waste it and squander it on riotous living in the far country. And you remember he'd come to himself in the big pen and he'd come back to the father, and while he's a great way off, the father would see him, and the father would run and fall on his uh, neck around his knees and embrace him and bring the robe and bring the rings and kill the fatted calf and make merry for this my son was dead now alive. And I mean, there was music and rejoicing and dancing. I mean, it was a celebration because Jesus cares about lost things being found. Amen. 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 But right in the middle of all of this, he tells a story that so often we overlook about a lady that has ten silver coins. And he asks the question, either what woman having ten coins, if she were to lose one, would not light a candle, sweep the house, and seek diligently till she finds it? Now, the sheep is one that's lost out in the far country, the sun's out in the far country, but the coin's lost down in the dwelling, down in the dark, down in the dirt. He's in the house but not at home. Who's understanding what I'm saying? Well, so I want to talk to you this evening about the lost coin, a few things that we're going to look at. And I just pray somehow as you get these Monday nights started off that the Lord just stir in your heart and my heart and our heart about lost things and about seeking after lost things and after rejoicing over lost things that are found. Because there's nothing that will thrill a church more than you getting excited about what heaven gets excited about. Right. And it's not building us budgets baptisms and my laws and arguments and business deeds, but it's lost things being found in back in place to the glory of Almighty God. Amen? Now, now firstly tonight, I, I want to talk to you about the losing of the silver. Now, now notice what the Bible says in verse 8. Who's still awake out there? Say amen. amen. Verse 8 says, I know what woman, if she had ten pieces of silver and she would lose a piece, would not light a candle, sweep the house, seek diligently till she find it. Let's talk about the losing of the silver. Now, when we first look at this, the first temptation, if we're not careful, is to think to ourselves, what's really the big deal? I mean, she had 10 silver coins, one's lost. Most of us would be happy if we had nine. Amen. Now, nine's not 10, but it's better than eight. <laughs> I grew up in southwest Louisiana, and I put that together all on my own. <laughs> Amen? Amen. I mean, nine's not ten, but it's better than eight. I can tell you, nine's certainly better than seven. Nine's a whole lot better than six. Now, let's apply that to our churches. Well, now, Brother Jerry, we may not be doing all we should do, but I'll tell you, we're doing better than most. And what we do is we measure ourselves with ourselves, we compare ourselves with ourselves, and we feel pretty good about ourselves. 
Come on. You say, now, preacher, what's, what's the big deal? Why is she all stirred up? I, I don't see why she's making a fuss. Why is she rearranging everything? Light the candles, sweeping the house. Why is she making such a big fuss? At least she has nine. You say, Brother Jerry, what's the big deal? I mean, if it were me, I'd just go on with the light. Oh, listen. But you see, it wasn't your coin. And the coin did not mean to you what it meant to her. Now see, a coin in biblical days was the equivalent of a day's wage. Now, had you been this late, lost an entire day's wage, you may think differently than you do now. Well, let's keep digging. Who's still listening? Say amen. amen. Back in biblical days, a Jewish maid would wear a headband. And embedded in that headband were ten silver coins. It'd be akin to our wedding ring. Now, I'm not much for jewelry. If you're a man and you wear jewelry, that's, that's your business. I would not wear this if my wife wouldn't kill me. Who knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> and and, I, and it, it doesn't mean I'm not thankful to be married. We've been married almost 24 years. I love that gal. It's just I'm not much on jewelry. I don't wear necklaces or whatever. I don't even know why I'm talking about this. It has nothing to do with what I'm preaching. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, this ring may not mean much to you, but it means a lot to me. Come on. Who's listening to what I'm saying? Amen. Amen. Ain't no woman like the one I got. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Hello, somebody. Amen. Hello. I'm helping that gal earn a lot of jewels for her crown. I can assure you of that. <laughs> so in biblical days, a Jewish maid, watch this, would have ten silver coins embedded in a headband on her head to represent, signify, she was married. So that lost coin may not mean much to you. But had you been her, it would have meant a whole lot to you. Now let's keep going. Are you still awake, say amen? If a Jewish maid had been unfaithful and committed adultery, she was instructed to remove a silver coin so as to signify, I've been unfaithful. So now that silver coin doesn't mean a whole lot to you. But had it been your head then, and it was Thanksgiving time. And you were gathering with some busybodies who loved to talk. And you had a coin missing. Can I get some help? You turned the whole house upside down to find it. Now you say, Brother Jim, what in the world are you talking about? I'm glad you asked. That boy walking down the street that's hooked on drugs may not mean much to you. But he does to someone. That's right. yeah. And that son or daughter that's without Jesus tonight Praise God. may not mean as much to the person sitting next to you, but it means everything to you. That's right. Come on. And had you been this lady, you'd have done whatever it takes that's right. tonight. Amen. I remember 20 years ago, I was uh, pastoring just outside Lake Charles, Louisiana, near our home. That's where we pastored for six years. And every October, we'd have a Bible conference. The second week of October, we'd have a Bible conference. People would come in from East Texas and, and from all around. We'd have two preachers every night in the morning, the evening, just similar to the one you described a while ago. And, and we'd have singing groups, and, 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 and it was just a fun time. And so you could just set your calendar by. The second week of October is when we do it. And so it was Tuesday night, second week, October, back in 1998. And I remember that we uh, had a packed house that evening. There was a group that brought their church bus from a church in East Texas, and they brought a group in. And, and we were so glad they were there, and we had eaten a meal, and we were having church, and the Lord was speaking and moving, and the second preacher was up to preach. And we gave the invitation, and there were four people, I vividly remember, who were coming forward, dealing with salvation, praying about giving their life to Christ. The Lord was dealing with them. They were under conviction. And seated right here in this section, fourth row back, there was a lady I had never met her, had no clue who she was, where she had come from, uh, had, had no clue anything about her. And all of a sudden, Brother Tracy, she got ahead. Now, I mean, this is a Baptist church. Can I get a witness? <laughs> and I've been a Baptist all my life. I'm just glad the Holy Ghost got me before the Baptist did. Who knows what I'm talking about? And so she got ahead. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? She got ahead. She stood to her feet. She raised her hand. Tears were rolling down her face. I don't know if it's possible to describe it, but she was laughing, crying, shouting, praising all at the same time. 
And this went on. She wasn't doing it to draw attention to herself. She wasn't interested in anyone in the room or what they had to say. She was not out of order. She was just worshiping the Lord, and she was obviously overcome and overwhelmed with emotion. The only problem is none of us knew who she was or what she was stirred up about. And while it was good, and while we were excited after about five minutes of it, we were kind of thinking, good night, lady. Until we discovered that one of the men that had come forward that night to be saved was her husband, whom she had prayed to be saved for 48 years. Well, when we all heard that, we said, honey, clear you off a uh, spot and have a spell. Who knows what I'm talking about? You see, that coin may not have meant much to you, but it meant everything to her. Amen? Amen? And I'm telling us tonight, ladies and gentlemen, listen, in your home, in, in your dwelling, in your family, in your sphere of influence, there are people that you know, that you love, that you care deeply for, passionately for, who are lost down in the dirt, down in the dark, down in the dwelling, and unless you light the candle and sweep the house and make up your mind to search Amen. diligently until you find it, it'll still be lost Amen. down in the dirt. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, Jesus speaks this to the heart of the Pharisees who are incensed that he's ministering to the tax collectors and sinners and says, I want you to know Jesus cares about lost things. I'm glad he does. Amen. Amen. I'm glad the Lord cares about lost men, women, boys, and girls. I'm glad he still does. Yes. Johnny Hunt said not long ago, never has there been a generation that's done a better job of defining the gospel and a poorer job of declaring the gospel. Mm -hmm. We sit around coffee pots and brag about how much we know and how intellectually astute we are over the gospel. And we talk in holy huddles among ourselves while we eat our donuts and drink our coffee about how astute we are in the gospel. And yet we never share it. We never go after lost things. God have mercy on us that we would have the heart of heaven and we'd be burdened as heaven is burdened for that which is lost. For the lost sheep, for the lost son, for the lost coin. God cares about lost things. Amen. Amen. Losing of the silver. Secondly, I want to talk to you this evening about the seeking of the silver. Who in the house is still awake? Say amen. amen. Now notice what it says, verse 7. I, the old woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she were to lose one piece, notice what she would do. Would not light a candle, sweep the house, seek diligently till she find it. Now in that verse, we're told, I believe, how we're to seek after lost coins. Now, now notice what she does. The first thing she does is she lights a candle. Now, if you're going to look for something in the dark, the first thing you've got to do is turn some light on. Can I get some help? Yeah. I mean, this is real, real deep tonight. We're, we're going deep. If you're going to find something in the dark, you've got to turn the light on. Yes, sir. Yeah. And I can promise you, the older you get, the more true that is. Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm thankful for that flashlight on the back of that phone. Can I get some help from anyone in the house? And so, if you're going to look for something down in the dark, down in the dirt, you got to light the candle. You see, the reason we're not finding lost coins, ladies and gentlemen, is there's no light. Praise God. You say, well, now, Brother Jerry, how do we turn the light on? Glad you asked. The Bible teaches us where the light is. Number one, it's in the Savior. That's right. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Amen. I believe what we ought to be focused on rather than preaching politics is preaching Jesus. That's right. Now, look right here, listen to me. Listen, don't, don't, I'm an equal opportunity offender. There's enough to go around. The Republican Party is not going to change this world. That's right. The Democratic Party is not going to change this world. Politicians are not going to change this world. And if that upsets you, mm, get you a mess of that. Can I get a witness? I'm, I'm telling you right now, the only answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, you without discussion. It's not about jokes and quotes and dopes and antidotes and group therapy and I'm okay and you're okay and all dogs go to heaven. The only answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And what we need to preach is not the Dow Jones market. What we need to preach is the Lord Jesus Christ for he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And what we need to focus on is the fact that we're a Christian church. We're set apart. We're peculiar. We're different. You can't sing about him too much. You can't talk about him too much. You can't brag about him too much. You can't can't preach about him too much. You can't lift him too high. What we ought to be focused on is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. Amen. The greatest compliment that ever be paid to your church is every time I go there, all they ever talk about is Jesus. Hallelujah. May it be said of all of us, that's all we ever talk about is Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And when you preach Jesus, the light dispels the darkness. And when the light is turned on, guess what? You start finding lost. 
That's right. Amen. 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 Let me tell you where else the light is found. It's found in the scriptures. The Bible says the entrance of thy word giveth light. Yeah. That's why we ought to preach the Bible. I don't mean preach about the Bible. I think we ought to preach the Bible. That's right. Now, I didn't come here tonight to get into a soapbox issues. I'm not a legalist. I can't stand legalism. But I guess if there's one area where I'm close, it would be on expository preaching. Because I believe what we need to do is not talk about the Bible. We need to preach the Bible. That's right. Because the Bible is not the word of man. It's the word of God. It doesn't contain the truth. It is true. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And I'm telling you, through the preaching of the Word of God, the light dispels the darkness, and the Holy Spirit has the ability to speak to hearts and illuminate hearts and turn the light on. And as the light's turned on, suddenly you can start finding lost things. Yes. What did she do? She turned the light on. How, how do we turn the light on? By preaching Jesus, the Savior. Yes. By preaching the Scriptures, the truth of the Word of God. But let me tell you the third area where the light's found. It's found in the saints. Jesus said, you remember, you're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill. Men don't light a candle, put it under a bushel. What do they do? They put it on a candlestick. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. And hear what I'm about to tell you. You can have evangelism and never have revival. Amen. But you cannot have revival without the natural consequence being evangelism. David prayed it this way in Psalm 51. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then, he said, create within me a clean heart, O God. Renew within me a right spirit. Then will I teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted unto thee. When we get our hearts right as a church, there'd be no... I'm not going to have a spell here. Y'all just got to excuse me a minute. You hear me? Amen? The day I'd get half as angry over my sin as I am yours, I'd already have revival. The day I'd get half as disturbed over my sin as I am our governments, I'd already have revival. The problem in the Baptist church is we've got two categories of sin. Big sin, little sin. Big sin's what you do. Little sin's what I do. And isn't it interesting? You can do the same thing your neighbor does. Your neighbor does it. You're asking God to put him flat on his back, give him a flat tire, don't let him eat until he gets right with you. But when you do the same thing he does, I'm glad God's the God of a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. <laughs> Amen. Amen. When your neighbor does it, they're a reprobate. When you do it, well, it's just because you're a redhead. <laughs> Come on, lighten up, folks. Lighten up. I got a couple of, this, I got a couple of red ears, all right? That, that doesn't constitute me. You say, well, that's just the way my, my mama was. My mama was that way. And so that's just the way I am. That's, that's why my, dad, my daddy used to do that. That's just the way that I am. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, we as the church of the living God need revival for survival. We need to get our heart right with God stop this silliness of tearing one another apart and get under the spout where the glory is coming out and repent. Amen. 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 Because the light's found in the saints. You want to know the number one reason people don't go to church? It's because they've already been. And all they got when they got there was a bunch of fussing. Come on. We go out to people and scream, come to church and get what I got. That's precisely why they don't come. <laughs> they're afraid if they come, they're going to get what we've got. <laughs> Who let me preach just 10 more minutes? Raise your hand. Just like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. That's what I'm talking about. What do you do to look for lost things? You've got to turn the light on. And the light's found in the saints. And I'm going to tell you listen, there's five gospels someone has said Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you. And remember, most people don't read the first four. That's right. Amen? Amen. That's right. Second thing she did, you watch it. She lit a candle. Watch this. She swept the house. She had to get rid of the debris. Amen. You know why we're not finding lost coins? There's too much junk right here. Yes. we got to let the Holy Spirit clean it up. Hallelujah. we got to let the Lord deal with it. Praise God. Amen. You never reach a point, girl. Where you're not growing, where you're not developing, where you're not maturing, where you're not relying on the Lord, where you're not dependent on the Lord. Are you listening? Amen. You better be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Whatever He tells you to do, the answer better be yes. Yeah, that's right. We need full <laughs> surrender. God could do more in this community in one second on His own than all of us working together, right. locking arms, could ever do in a day of life. 
And you can try to build a church all you want to and develop a crowd all you want to, but what we need more than anything is the divine presence of holy God. And when God shows up, it's on. Amen. Amen. We need to sweep the house. We need to deal with our sin. We need to deal with our rebellion. We need to deal with we need to deal with wickedness. Yes. You heard about the guy who came to church every every service when you when he left, he'd meet the pastor in the foyer, and he said, Pastor, you really let them have it today. I mean, every single service for years, boy, you really told them. One winter rolled around. It was a hard freeze. The pastor got there. No one was there. He was just about to lock the doors and go home. And in walked one man. Guess who it was? It was that man. He thought, well, you can't have church, just the two of us. And then he thought, now, wait a minute. I, I've, I've waited for this opportunity for a long while. He said, pull up a chair. He goes, you're going to preach? He said, I am, just to you. And he reared back and preached the hardest sermon he had ever preached in his life to that audience of one. And he walked to the foyer and he thought, now what will the wise guy say today? And wouldn't you know it, as was his custom, he walked right up to the pastor and he said, Pastor, I'll tell you, if they'd have been here tonight, you'd have really let them have it. <laughs> Amen? Now, now listen to what I'm telling you. You know, Sunday morning, Monday nights, all these services that we have. And I, and I understand there's nothing magical about coming to an altar. I get it. But isn't it interesting that it just seems like in every church, the cream of the crop are the ones that are at the altar every service. And then there are some people that never do. And I understand there are people physically that can't get up and move. I'm not trying to put you on the guilt trip. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not trying to turn this into some sacrament. I'm just simply asking you this. Could I just ask you this? Are you telling me that it's possible for you to sit through all these services and God never talks to you about anything? Mm. Wow. Come on. You mean to tell me it's always everyone else that needs to repent, it's everyone else that needs to get right, it's everyone else, and God never deals with you? Come on, brother. That's wrong. Preach. Amen? Amen. I poured some alphabets in a bowl the other day and it spelled out repent. Who knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> I really didn't lighten up, folks, all right? <laughs> I mean, you know, someone asked me the other day, do you and your wife ever have arguments? I said, oh, no, not at all. <laughs> now, my, I always was told there's no such thing as a dumb question. That's a dumb question. <laughs> do you and your wife ever have a fuss? As if there's actually a couple out there that never does. Don't you meet me in the foyer and tell me that you and your wife have never had a fuss because one of a couple of things, one, you're a liar, or two, you've never laid eyes on the person since you've said, I do. Who knows what I'm <laughs> And so I said, no, we don't have. We're getting our brother over here ready for marriage. Can I get a week? <laughs> Join the club. Can I get some help? And so I tell folks, my wife and I never have a fight. We just have an intense moment of fellowship. The neighbors can hear us. <laughs> So the other day she did something made me so mad. I said, Julie, do you know how I know I love you? She said, how's that? I said, you're the only human that can make me so mad I can see different shades of red and I still want to be around you. If you made me that mad, I'd get away from you. Who knows what I'm talking about? She makes me that mad and I come back for more. I'm glutton for much. And so we were in the house. I don't remember what was going on, but she just mm, mm, stirred me up. And so, I mean, we were having a little fuss. I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go in here and study the sermon. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so I walked into the room, and about 20 minutes later, I came back out, and this is what she said. She said, you can't study, can you, big boy? <laughs> <laughs> we made a covenant before the Lord when we were married. We'd never go to sleep. Without settling a dispute. 24 years later, I can stand before you and tell you we've never gone to sleep one night without settling a dispute. Now, we've gone up four nights without sleep, but we've never gone to sleep <laughs> without settling a dispute. Amen? My greatest prayer partner is my wife. I'm glad, I'm glad to know that you would pray for me, but the person that can pray for me the most effectively is my wife. That's why 1 Peter says, Y'all dwell together in unity with your spouse, lest your prayers be hindered. That's right. That's right. Don't let the sun go down if you're still stewing in your act. We need to get the, we need to get our hearts swept, church. Yeah, right. We need to get our act right with God. Yeah. You want to know why? Because some of you have some lost coins, and you're begging God to do a work, and God wants to do a work, but you got to sweep your house so you can find the coins. Amen? Yeah. We need a revival so that we can have an awakening that spills over into the lost world of the community, and there be an awareness of who God is. Yeah. You can't create that. 
You can't generate that. Southern Baptists can't make that happen. We can't make people hungry for God. We can't give people an interest in God. But I'll tell you, God can. Amen. So what did she do? She lit the candle. She swept the house. Notice what else she did. She searched diligently until she found it. I asked myself tonight, would I really stay on the trail that long? That long? Are you guys listening to what I'm telling you? That long. Whatever would you do? Whatever it takes. Amen. Or have you reached the point where you said there's no use? He'll never change. She'll never change. I'll tell you, my husband, he'll never change. My, my wife, she'll never change. Our kids, they'll never change. Those grandkids, they'll never change. My sister died at 48 of pancreatic cancer. She was a single mother. She had three boys. And, and I'll never forget, I often think, Tragically, the oldest boy died right after she died in his sleep, 27 years old. The remaining two boys, every time I'm around them, just saw them a few days ago, every time I'm around them, I'm reminded of being in the hospital with my sister holding her hand as she was dying. And she looked at me and said, Jerry, you promise me you'll help take care of my boys. And her name was Cammie, and I said, Cammie, I'll do my best. And she died, and so the youngest boy moved in with my mom and dad, not long after my dad died. And here was Nicholas, his life was turned upside down. Never had a daddy. Now his mama's gone. Now his grandfather's gone. And so he moves out to California, and he just goes through a phase in his life where if you tell him right, it's left. If you tell him left, it's right. He's not going to do a thing you say. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So he moved back home. I, I was preaching in southwest Louisiana at the time and he came to church. And I hate to confess this, but it's just us here and I'm going to tell the truth. He was seated in the back and he would always call Uncle Jerry when he needed something. And he was seated in the back that night. He came forward on a Sunday night. He wanted to give his life to the Lord and he prayed. And when the service was over, I should not admit it, but I'm going to admit it. I thought to myself, well, I hope he knew. I, I, hope, I hope that's real. And I told my wife in the car, I said, I'm, I'm just afraid Nicholas is in a bind and wants to get out. About two weeks later, he was at our house. And he said, uh, he called me, he said, can I come spend the night with you like I used to? Could Aunt Julie cook for me like she used to? I said, come on, brother. And he got up in the middle of the night, he said, brother Jimmy, Uncle Jim, he said, uh, did you know the Bible said this? I said, what? He started reading. He started reading words. I didn't even know he could read. And that boy got the whole load of inside. Yeah. And then not long after that, he found him a godly woman. They got married. They're in church every time the doors are open. That's been years ago. Now they just found out they're going to have their first baby. And I'm telling you, I'm so tickled I can do cartwheels. Are you listening to that? Now that coin may not mean much to you. But let me tell you what that coin means to me. I remember my sister taking her last breath saying, please help take care of my boy. And I'm glad to know I don't have to take care of them anymore. Because they're in the hands of God. And he can do a whole lot better with them than I can. And I get a witness. Seek diligence. So there's the losing the silver, seeking the silver. Thirdly, finally, I'm almost done. Stay with me a few minutes. Listen up. There's the losing of the silver, the seeking of the silver. Thirdly, there's the finding of the silver. Now, now, notice what happens in this story. It's real interesting. It talks about the woman that would light a candle, sweep the house, seek diligently that she finds it. And then when she finds it first time, here's what she does. She calls her friends and neighbors together and she says, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace that I lost. Now, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention or not. The Bible doesn't say this, but this is what I think in my imagination she did when she found that home. Are you ready? Watch. She picks it up. <laughs> Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You see it? Ten. They're all there. And she calls everyone together. And she says, Rejoice with me. It's celebration. I have found the peace that was lost. And then Jesus closes it out by saying, likewise, or in the same way I say to you, well, who's the you? Don't you remember? He's talking to the Pharisees. 
They're mad because he's dealing with tax collectors and sinners. They don't have a clue what he's talking about. They're fit to be tithed. They're so wrapped up in religion. They're so incensed. And Jesus says to them likewise, do you not get it? If you had a coin and lost it, you'd turn the world upside down to find it. Do you not get it? If you had a hundred sheep and one was lost, you'd do whatever it takes to find it. Do you not get it? If you had a boy that was out in the world, you'd be waiting on him and run to him and embrace him. Do you not get it? God cares about lost things. And I want you to know, he says, there's joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner. Now here's how most preachers say it. Angels rejoice whenever a sinner gets saved. The only problem is that's not what the Bible says. It does not say angels rejoice when a sinner gets saved because angels cannot rejoice when someone gets saved because they have no clue what it is to be saved. That's, right. That's why the Bible says they're ministering spirits and they inquire diligently from us of these things known as salvation. That's right. They know about the majesty of God, the glory of God, the power of God, but they don't have a clue about the grace of God. That's what they want to learn from us. And when you die and go to heaven, you're not going to heaven to be an angel. You're going to heaven with the angels to worship the Lord God Almighty. And if you really want your mind blown, according to Scripture, angels are here present with us to look in on these things, and we're supposed to teach them some stuff about what it is to be saved by the grace of God. Meaning they're learning from us. Is anyone listening to me? Say amen. amen. So what the Lord says was, there's joy in the presence of the angels. Well, what in the world's in the presence of the angels? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Do you remember they're around the throne saying, holy, 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 one holy for God the Father, one holy for God the Son, one holy for God the Holy Spirit. Angels guard, angels cover the throne. And what's in the presence of angels is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels, which means all of heaven rejoices whenever a lost sheep is found, a lost son is found, a lost coin is found. That means you're in good company as a church when you rejoice over what heaven rejoices. That's right. amen. Amen? amen. I said amen. amen. Do you know the best? I, I kind of finish. I'm the typical preacher. I close about three times every time I preach. Right. Uh, do you know that the best churches in the world meet under the tree? Yeah. You didn't know that, did you? You didn't know. Did you know the best churches in the world meet in the underground? Do you know that? Best churches in the world don't even have a bill. Come on. Do you know that? You didn't know it. Because if you knew it, you'd be saying amen, but you didn't. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you why you didn't know it. I'm not rebuking you. It's because the problem with so many of us is we think Christianity is nothing more than a miracle. Come on. And we forget that the greatest believers in the world are living persecuted lives. Yeah. And they're not even able to meet out in public. Hello? Hello? Now, there's nothing wrong with buildings. They're good. Amen? Amen. Nothing wrong with nice, comfortable chairs. I like them. What about you? It's, it's nice to have. Nothing wrong with good stuff. You know, some churches you pull up to, they pick you up in a golf cart. I know some people that left the church and went to another church because the other church had a golf cart to pick them up. <laughs> You know, all the, all the experts tell you that the most important room in your church is the ladies' restroom. I don't spend any time in there. Can I get some help? <laughs> they say the second most important room in your church is the nursery. You've got to have a good nursery. You've got to have a nice paved parking lot. Well-lit parking lot. People will not come if you don't have a well-lit parking lot. For 11 years, I've traveled and preached revivals in over 600 churches, and I'm telling you, some of the best churches I've preached at in the United States of America don't even have a parking lot. I mean, they're walking in mud to get in, but the power of God's there, and that's why they're there. And I'm not decrying a little vendor, a golf cart, or a nice ladies' restroom, or a nice nursery. That's good. Most Baptists think all is well if they meet budget. Right. Well, I was 
wrap up, but <laughs> you told off on yourself. <laughs> so, I mean, there are some people that have no clue what John 3.16 is, but they know Article 2, Section 1, Paragraph 3 of the Bible. <laughs> and they know something about this man named Robert, who runs a lot of churches. Robert's rules of order, whatever in the world all of that is. And I mean, just it's foolish. It really, really is. I mean, it really, really is. I'm not decrying order. I get it. Okay, fine. That's great. I understand it. Go four weeks in this church past the altar and pray plate and never collect a penny. Not one red cent for four weeks. I promise you'll have an emergency meeting. Go four weeks, never see anyone saved. I wonder if you'll say a word. Come on. Come on. I get buildings, I get budgets, I get baptisms, I get bylaws, I get, I, I get it. I really don't. I'm not being ugly. Facebook Live, cameras, I, I promise you I get it. But at the end of the day, the one that owns a cattle on a thousand hills is not in prison. He's not in prison. Let me say it again. He's not impressed. But what moves heaven to thunderous applause and rejoicing is when one lost God is found. And what we ought to be about more than anything, are you listening? Is find them lost God. So let me close. Uh, I grew up in a family of funeral directors. We have three first cousins that are in the funeral business. My brother owns a funeral home in our hometown. My niece is a mortician. My nephew is a mortician. I was the seventh in the line of work for four years, and God delivered me. <laughs> now, he did not completely deliver me, because every once in a while, he'll send me to a church that will remind you of a funeral home. Who knows what that is? You've been there, haven't you? Did you hear about the lady down in church the other day? They called the undertaker. They had to drag out 22 people to find out which one she was. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a drum roll right there. <laughs> and so I grew up in a city. Matter of fact, just real quickly, the way I got saved and called to preach was going to funerals. And through going to funerals in my teenage years, I'd hear the gospel preach to funerals, and that's what drew me to salvation. That's how I got saved. That's how God called me to preach. Amen? And so uh, that's how I learned how to minister to people. And um, so I, I was in the funeral business. I recommend everyone work in the funeral home, and I recommend everyone work for their brother. <laughs> Best years of my life. Now, this was before the days of cell phones and, and all of that stuff. And I'm looking at some teenagers. You mean before the days of cell phones? Like, what are you talking about? And that's what my son says when I tell him about before the days of cell phones. What does that mean? <laughs> does anyone remember that? Yeah. And so at night, we would, we would transfer the phone from the funeral home to someone's house who was on call. And since I was low man, since I was the boss's brother, it came to me every night. <laughs> And I'd have to get up a lot of nights, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, get dressed, put a suit on, go to the morgue, go to the nursing home, go to the funeral home, go to the scene of an accident. And uh, I've been around a lot of death. And I want you to listen. I've never seen, and I don't mean this to be said, I've never seen any rejoicing in a morgue. Never. But let me tell you where all the happiness is. Let me tell you where all the action is. Ready? I'm not I'm going to get turned loose <laughs> at the nursery. There, there's a place in the hospital where all those little ones, little babies are, and you take the meanest, sourest person you know. Don't look around at other people. Look here. <laughs> you, you, take, you take the meanest person that you know and put them in front of that glass and let them look at that little baby, especially when it's theirs. And you look closely. Now, where would you rather be, the morgue or the nursery? And what would you prefer your church to be, the morgue or the nursery? And I'm going to tell you, a church where God's honored, where something's happening, is a church.
church that rejoices over the lost coin. That's right. That coin may not mean a thing to someone else, but it means the world to you. Like the candle, sweep the house and go after it till you find it and don't ever give up. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? I, I want to ask a couple of questions. We're going to have a time of prayer as a church. And I want to just ask a couple of questions. First question, who in the house tonight would say, Preacher, I know I'm saved. I know I'm born again. I know I'm a child of God. I know I'm going to heaven. Not because I'm a Baptist, not because I'm religious, not because I've done more right than wrong or more good than bad, but because Jesus has moved into my life and saved me. I have a biblical testimony. If that's you, would you slip your hand in here as a testimony? God bless you. Amen, church. Hallelujah. Put your hand down here. Second question. Who among us right now would say, Brother Jerry, I've got a lost coin. And it's down in the dirt. It's down in the dark. I can't find it. And I'll tell you, it may not mean much to other people. But it sure does mean everything to me. It's my dad, it's my mom, it's my son, it's my daughter, it's my grandchildren, it's my niece, my nephew, my aunt, my uncle, my husband, my wife, it's my neighbor, my coworker, my classmate, it's my coach, it's the one that works in the cafeteria, it's my teacher, it's my student, it's the principal, it's the one that drives my bus, it's it's the people that little me. I'm telling you, I'm so burdened. I'm so burdened. Brother Jerry, I've got a lost coin, and that coin has a name. And I want that coin to be found. And I want it to be back in place. And I want the Lord to rejoice. And I want to rejoice with him. Who in this room would say, Preacher, that's me. I've got a lost coin and that lost coin has a name. Amen. Amen. Someone has said, hell is hell and we don't tell what kind of people are we. Takes three things for someone to be saved. Takes the word of God. Takes the Holy Spirit. Now listen to the third one. Takes a human being. God uses humans to spread the gospel. Are you listening you say, I got saved reading the gospel track. Who wrote that gospel track? Who gave you that gospel track? A human being. We're links in a chain. One plants, one waters. God gives the increase. We don't save anyone. The Holy Spirit's the real soul. But God wants to use you and use me. And I'm telling you, it's our job to tell. The results are up to God. And all of us have a coin that's out of place. And I'm telling you, I believe a good way to kick off these marvelous Mondays for a church. It's just to begin with a burden and a brokenness in our spirit over lost things. He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, will doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And everything's got to begin with a burden. And we got to get under the burden, ladies and gentlemen, to lose a little sleep, to lose a little comfort, to pray for our sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters, and not just curse the darkness and curse this generation and say they don't understand, but to be a bridge and to be a difference maker and to really, really care and to really bombard heaven for the glory of God for these lost coins. I want to just ask us, those of us that will, there's nothing magical I've already said about coming to an altar, kneeling at an altar, but there is something powerful about just praying, obeying, doing what the Lord says. And if you're physically able, I just want to encourage you, those of us that raised our hands and said, I've got a lost coin. I want to encourage you to come get it this altar. And just get out of your seat. Come on. Get on your knees and by faith in the name of Jesus, pray for the name of that coin that you're broken for, you're burdened for, you're disturbed over this evening. I mean pray in faith believing, pray in faith trusting, pray in, pray in faith knowing that God answers prayer. He's a mountain moving, prayer answering God. He can do big things. He can do anything. And I'm telling you, he wants to save. He can save. He will save. He did it for you. He did it for me. Our brother said a while ago, I was the one that he left the 99 for. He did it for you. What he's done for us, he'll do for others. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. And, and let's just get on our knees as we begin these Monday nights, these series of meetings over the next several weeks. And I mean cry out to our Father in faith over the lost ones that we're burdened for, that need the Lord Jesus. Don't give up on your son. Don't give up on your daughter. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your home or your family. Don't give up on your nieces and nephews and grandchildren. Don't give up on your neighbors. Don't give up on them. Don't relinquish them to the evil one, but pray in faith, believe and trust in knowing that we pray to a God that can do big things. He can do anything. I'm telling you, God can save anyone. God's a big God. Does anyone believe that in this house tonight? He's a big God. He can do it. And so I want to encourage the saints of God at this altar, in this church, all over this sanctuary, you just even, where you are, if you want to even out loud, to call the name of that coin. Lord, I pray for Nicholas. Lord, I pray for Chad. Lord, I pray for Susan. Lord, I pray for... You call their name out to the Lord, Grandma and 
Grandpa. I mean, pray for your grandchildren. Pray for your sons and daughters. Plead the blood of Jesus over them. And ask the Lord to bring them to salvation, to light the candle, to sweep the house, to seek diligently that you find them. Lord, I pray for every person in this house that's burdened or lost loved ones. God, in Jesus' name, that you hear their cry. God, that you go before them. God, that you prepare the way. God, that you move upon hearts. I pray for some that maybe are even in prison tonight. Lord, there's no barrier, no distance too great for you. God, you can save anyone, anywhere, anytime, and even tonight, Lord, in that prison cell, you can speak to their heart and draw them to yourself. Lord, there may be someone in a ballroom this evening. Lord, there's someone that's out in the prodigal. Lord, I'm asking in Jesus' name that you speak to their heart and you draw them to yourself. God, I pray you use this church in the coming days, coming weeks, coming months to see the greatest harvest of souls they've ever seen for your glory. That lost coins would be found. The light would shine in the darkness. The house would be swept. This church would get under a burden to seek diligently in the way I did. And Lord, after they find it, that they would call their family and their friends and neighbors together and rejoice because all of heaven is rejoicing. Now, for those that are praying tonight, you just continue to do so until you know your burdens lifted. If you need someone to pray for you, there'll be people here to pray. When you're done, you can go back to your seat. But until then, you stay there as long as you need to. If you need your pastor to pray for you, he's here to pray. Others are here to pray. But would there be anyone before we stand, before we continue the service, would there be anyone here tonight to say, Preacher, I need Jesus. I cannot say for sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. And what I need more than anything is to be saved by the grace of God. I need the Lord Jesus to save me. I won't call you out by name or embarrass you, but I'll pray for you. Is there anyone here tonight to say, Preacher, pray for me? I need the Lord. Would you slip your hand in the air that you need anyone here for me? I need to be saved. I want to give my life to the Lord. Anyone in the house this evening? Anyone here among us? I don't see a hand. So everyone here tonight, are, are you confident you know the Lord? You're at peace. Well, thank you for that peace. Thank you for that peace. Let's trust Him. Let's trust Him. You that are physically able, you that are not at the altar to pray, let's stand our feet. Let's just continue to worship the Lord. Our pastor will be standing here. If you need him to pray for you, we're just going to take a moment before he handles the service the way he feels way it. Feels way. But if you need prayer, if you need someone to pray for you, you get out of your seat, you come. Why don't we just believe the Lord that He can do big things? He's able. He's more than able. Does anyone believe that tonight? Amen. He's more than able.
You know what happens between people? It's not personal, it's spiritual. That's exactly what it is. It's, it's not personal between us. Nothing is. Every bit of it is spiritual. Spiritual warfare. And you know, every year I look for this when we start our marvelous Mondays for the devil to raise his head up. And the only reason he is is because he knows God's got something good coming. And he wants to tear it apart before it ever gets started. 